Excited to hear as well. Uh, well, oops. is a heuristic park. Uh, why we can't we can fake it until we make it. Uh, so our presenter uh, Iskimo is going to uh, share on these topics. Uh, why do we believe in fake news? And what are news silos? And more topics. This lecture discusses the psychological reasons as seen from the perspective of a social engineer. And uh, we were talking beforehand. He wanted to. Uh, point out that, you know, if you're thinking of social engineering just in terms of, of one area, might come up in a security-focused uh, con like this, um, you're thinking just in terms of manipulation to, say, bypass a security protocol, you're missing a lot of the apparatus of what he'll be talking about. Uh, this talk um, explores further and focuses on ways that we respond neurologically, hardwired, uh, two, two details, and, uh, and, and what some of the consequences are related to this topic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Take it away. Um, so um, first and foremost, I might need to apologize up front because I might look a little fatigued and off balance, and that's not because it's day three and it's 11 a.m. at a hacker camp, because it is. Um, kudos to you for being here at this time. And the only advantage that we have is that it's not too hot yet in this tent. So with me, it's actually medical. Um, I'm suffering some post-COVID things. So if you see me wobble around a little bit, that's medical. And it's OK. I'm fine. But it looks a bit funny sometimes. Uh, that having said, um, I can fully uh, adhere to what you said. Wear a mask when asked. Protect each other. Be careful, because COVID is not over. So. That being said, uh, a small introduction, and this is very scary for me. In my spare time, I do some magic for children, uh, little card tricks and a little um, making stuff disappear and reappear. And the most scary thing you can do is perform for magicians because they know all your shit. And they will call you out if it's not perfect. And I have the same feeling here because it's all hackers, you know. You, you guys know about social engineering. And Probably because you're here, you know a little bit more, or at least you're interested in social engineering. So I'll have to do my best today, and I'll try. This talk is meant to be a little longer than uh, the 50 minutes that I got, so I might skip some things. But first, by a raise of hand, how many people understand Dutch quite well? OK, so there is a, some slides in there, uh, which are examples, but they are in Dutch. So I'll be showing them. Um, not taking too much time about them, but they're funny to see, so uh, that's good. A uh, small introduction, I'm a social engineer. I have been for a lot of time, a lot of years. Um, I've been pen testing companies professionally for 15. After that, my face got, you know, on too many wanted posters, and I had to stop doing that because, well, if you show up and people say, hey, that's the guy from last time, that is problematic. Uh, also for the rest of your team, still conducting the test, so I decided to go and teach. And that's what I do at this moment. Uh, so, um, Furthermore, I'm a researcher. This stuff is very interesting. It stays very interesting, so you read all about it and you, you delve into it very deeply. Um, and I do stuff like this, public speaking. I attend conferences. And of course, we have this wonderful Angry Nerds podcast. It's in Dutch. Find it. It's funny. Right. Um, I have been sweating on this one for a long time because I needed to form a definition of social engineering and I started writing its techniques, psychological techniques to uh, get your password. No, that's not it. It's uh, to, to make you do things that you actually don't want or cannot or no, that's not it either. And, and it became a very, very long and confusing definition like most job descriptions, very long and confusing, and half of it is not even true. Um, so I came up with this. Actually, it's two words. There's the word social, which is any interaction you have with other people, you can uh, initiate or undergo it. And you have engineering, which is you have a plan, you, you design something, 
And from that design, you go and build a house, a bridge, anything. So if you combine those two and you say, okay, I'm going to have a social interaction with anyone by a design to get to a certain goal, that is what social engineering is. It's nothing more, it's nothing less. This is a very clean definition that I could come up with just by translating those two words. Uh, so what is it? It is being clever with the truth. And that, you can do that by words, just by plain lying. We'll get to that later on. You, can, uh, you could uh, indirectly lie by showing up in a nice suit uh, because you have an interview or something. Uh, or you could um, <clears throat> fuddle with the truth. <clears throat> we'll get to that later as well. Or you could just set the scene. We see it in Bitcoin. It's great. Bitcoin is great. Look at all these fancy offices and these great companies that do all kinds of wonderful stuff. Of course, Bitcoin is not a very good idea. At least that's my opinion, but it gets hyped a lot. Sorry for the guys having Bitcoin. I mean, yeah, it's, it's not a good time for Bitcoin. So who does it? And this is uh, actually a small nerd joke. Um, some of you will get it. Um, criminals, lawyers, um, salespeople, of course, um, but parents also. We have a four-year-old, and we have to social engineer the hell out of her to get her to eat her veggies uh, and get to sleep in time. But children can also social engineer very well, especially ours. She knows exactly how to look, how to smile, to get candy, or um, to stay up later. Or, and, and I don't know, how many of you have kids? Respect. <laughs> so this is very hard, you know. They, they come up with all kinds of crazy stuff to not have to go to sleep. I need to pee, I need to drink, I need to do... That's also social engineering. You just adjust your normal behavior to, to make it logical what you're doing. So actually anyone, everyone, social engineers. I am not at this moment because this is what I actually look like, but at work I wear other stuff. Of course, you don't go to work in the... In the Couch outfit, let's say it like that. So why do we do it? This is still a, an introduction that you're probably familiar with. Uh, you could go for influencing people. And there is a subtle difference, but a very important difference between influence and manipulation. Because I think manipulation is the bad kind and influence is good. You can also, you can influence people to get them in a certain track which is actually in their own interest. Um, an example that I sometimes use is that when you go to the hospital and there's a doctor, he comes up to you with his hands in his pockets, he says, oh yeah, you have cancer. That is weird, right? So these doctors, they get trained to bring this news in a special way. You have to serve it up um, so you won't black out. If I go and tell you, hey, you have cancer, I can be sure that anything I say after that will not not land, you, you, you just don't hear it. And it's in your interest and in the interest of the doctor that you keep listening. So he probably invites you over, like, okay, come sit down, have some coffee. I looked at your test results. This is what I found. Um, there is treatments, but it is severe. So we have to do this and this and this and this and this. And he won't use the word cancer until it's absolutely necessary, just to keep you listening. And doctors know this, so that's what they learn. Uh, social engineering influencing also has a good side, but when it gets to manipulation, that's bad. You don't want that. So there are some techniques, and I love listening to radio commercials. Uh, I'm the only one, I guess. Uh, and it can be really funny, because in, in, in the Netherlands, we have dot .nl, and that rhymes with snel, the Dutch word for fast. So they make all these rhymes. Oh, ga snel naar dit, 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 punt nl. That's not because it rhymes. And it's not because they think they have a unique little slogan, but it implies um, urgency. Very subtly, but it implies urgency. Oh, we have only a few left. That also implies urgency and scarcity. So we, we want it more. Uh, so these are techniques that you see in marketing but you see them in a lot of other places too. Um, the, the, the last one that's uh, 
one I learned very late in life. Um, you get a free phone when you renew your subscription. The phone is not free. It's not. You pay for it several times <laughs> through the higher subscription rates that you accept. It's, it's not a free deal. But uh, these are tricks. They, they, actually, they tell you that it's a free phone, right? So what's interesting is I would love to see a judge uh, look at a case like that and say, yeah, look, I said it's a free phone. It's not free. I want a free phone. So and try to... There is actually a guy who does that with all kinds of commercials, and he, he wins those cases as well. This is very funny. Um, so we can play on emotions, and this is where it gets interesting. Uh, we know that fear is a big one, insecurities, lots of people are insecure, and if you go and stress them, um, and later on we'll see why, they will cooperate sooner. Then there is greed. When I tell you that I can double your money in two days, of course you want that. Who wouldn't want it? Um, but it's also a cue for you to start thinking, because when it sounds too good to be true, it is. Um, and then there is confidence. Of course, we can get the other way around and get people really confident about something and then take them along for a ride, and they fail miserably, but because we are very good at getting them. That's the confidence games, right? You see them on TV all the time. Uh, and then the last one, and that's the one I'm talking about today, there is cognitive biases and there is heuristics. And these are uh, properties of your brain that we try to exploit. Because what would be better for a social engineer to find a flaw in your brain, play on that flaw, and you don't have any defense against it? I mean, you will go for it, even though you know you are scammed. Um, it's like, it's impossible not to be startled. Think about it, it's not, you, you can't not be startled. And we tested this with a, a, a guy, very highly educated guy, very, very smart, and we told him, okay, we have a haunted house here, we build it, and there is a few rooms, so uh, we'll tell you from, from any second when you go in, uh, after two seconds, you feel a little bump. There is um, something on the floor. The, the doorknob is slimy. Uh, there is uh, like fake spider webs, and there is stuff, and there is wind blowing, and an evil sound, and you hear this and you hear that. And after exactly seven seconds, a guy in a black suit on the floor will grab your ankles. Seven seconds. So just go in there and count. One, two, three. And it was impossible for this guy not to be startled. Even when we counted down through an intercom, we sat there and we said, five, four, three, two, bleh. And he, was, he still was, it's impossible. Because this takes place in another part of your brain. And if you can tap into that as a social engineer, you always win. So this is where this talk gets interesting. And of course, there's identity fraud. This is the for first recorded case ever of identity fraud. I just wanted to show you that. Um, OK, who's very fast at thinking? Because we see patterns all the time, right? Who's very fast? What's on the question mark? Who knows? Just by raise of hand, who can see it? OK, any answers? 25? Okay, any, anything else on 25? It's not true. It's not 25. And this is because the fast part of the brain, there is two systems actually, uh, Daniel Kahneman, a uh, very famous psychologist, uh, writer, he talks about these two systems. We have the fast and the, the slow system. And the slow system is the reasonable part. They think, okay, look, what, is, what, is, what does it say? And what is this? And the fast part says 5, 10 feet, oh, it's 25. And you're done with it. So we tap into that, the fast part. It is not 25, because the answer is right there. It's 5. 1 is 5, so 5 is 1, right? That's what, what it says. This is not a range. It looks like a range, but it is not. And only if you tap into the slower part of your brain and say, look, what? what? Oh, yeah, it's right there. It's five. Then you get the right answer. 
So this is a perfect example for what we call heuristics. And heuristics are shortcuts in your brain. Why do we have these? It does not, it, it says so. Oh, yeah, of course, mathematically this is incorrect. True, true, but for this example it is, um, because, you know, but okay, I should, have, I should have said 1x or something, so I could move it away with it. You're right, very, very sharp. Okay, so why do we do this? Uh, the brain has uh, an energy saver. And lucky, lucky for us, because if your brain would be on all the time and in, in thinking mode, it would consume about a quarter of your energy. And for something that has a, a weight of only 2% of your whole body, using a quarter of your energy, that's a lot. So your brain taught itself to go into saving mode. And saving mode is very easy because we have all these heuristics. We, can, we see a range, we say, oh yeah, you can see that, that's 25. I don't have to go and calculate, I don't have to go and check, I, think, I see it, it's right there. I see a pattern. And this is what the brain does. Also, the brain has, if you, if you, they call it neuroplasticity, it forms new um, paths between your neurons, and when you do that often enough, they become common sense. Later on, we, we go into uh, the, the guys that deny COVID and stuff like that, that, that has a reason. No one is that stupid, right? I, I hope. Okay, so there's a few of those, and some of them are very funny, and some of them are not. Actually, they're all not, but some are, you can laugh about them. Uh, the expert heuristic, if there is an expert and we, we know that he is or she is, then we believe him. If the doctor tells me that something is wrong, I believe him. Um, if my garage tells me there is something wrong with my car, I... Wrong, wrong example, maybe, but... Um, doctors, um, normally, you, you trust. So there's the consistency heuristic. Uh, it's all about um, when you see something often enough, you see it there, and you see it there, and you see it there, and there's several sources, and they all say the same. Well, it should be true, right? That's the consistency, uh, consistency heuristic. Then there's a bandwagon heuristic, and that's everybody does it. Who of you has WhatsApp on their phone? On a hacker camp? Are you kidding? Okay, who has Signal? And who of you has trouble convincing their family and friends to leave WhatsApp alone? <laughs> Almost everyone, right? And what's the argument you always get? Yeah, they all have it. I won't miss out, because if I don't have WhatsApp, I can't message all my friends. So um, I have this discussion with my dad. He says, yeah, all my friends are on WhatsApp. I say, you have only two friends left. The rest is dead. <laughs> um, he doesn't like that argument, but it's true. So there's no reason for him to be on signal. Uh, but I couldn't win that argument. As a social engineer, that's very frustrating. So I found another way to win it, even though his argument was fell it in his eyes. I said, okay, so you don't want any pictures of your grandchild. Now he has signal, that's very good. Um, that's the bandwagon heuristic. Persuasive intent is actually reverse. I have this very strongly. If I see a salesman, something with a plastic smile, and hi, hello, I recognize all these techniques, and I, my, my, the hairs in the back of my neck, they just stand up, and I'm like, okay, fuck off. And that's the the persuasive intent heuristic. Um, and on the expectancy violation heuristic, that's, uh, I have a slide to illustrate that, it's very funny, but it's in Dutch. So this is the expert heuristic. In the old days, this was the expert. He was on a square in the market, and he was there, and this was the doctor, right? He said, oh yeah, you're sick, we'll just let some blood out. Because your blood is probably sick, we let something out, and then you'll be fine. And take this, it's only four pieces of gold, but it helps against everything. Sounds a bit like the guy that comes over to your office and said, look, I have the problem to all your network solutions, right? all your network problems, right? I said it right. I have the problem to all your network solutions. 
But this guy has a nice silk tie and he comes over to you and says, look, if you buy this, you have no further problems. This is a super modern firewall. And it's smart and it has blockchain. <laughs> Recognize this? These guys. <laughs> but it's the same as this guy. Um, so I have some experts here. Um, any opinions? Who is the real expert? We have uh, this guy from a Dutch commercial a long time ago. Wij van WC Eend adviseren WC Eend. Um, expert. No? Okay, then uh, person B, the guy from Twitter. Um, expert. No? Okay, C, that's a guy, that's an actor with a white coat. Pretending to be a dentist, no. Remember that guy by, with, with D, remember him? He was hilarious. That was great. Yeah, I mean, war is never funny, but this guy was. He should have had a red nose. There are no American tanks in Iraq, and you saw them pass by behind him. It was hilarious. So, um, then uh, Gerrit Himstra, he's the weather guy, Dutch weather guy. Expert? Mm, yeah, maybe. Okay, let's continue. Uh, Yomanda, remember Yomanda? <laughs> You're all healed, <laughs> if only. Um, and then we have, who's that? G. I don't think anyone at a hacker congress would have heard of this woman. Rion Verrijbroek, expert? Well, maybe an expert social engineer. We don't know. But the true expert is Gerrit Himstra, the weather guy. He has two masters and five bachelors in all kinds of climates studies, he knows a lot about his work. And the fact that he comes on TV and very casually tells you that the sun's going to shine tomorrow doesn't mean that he is not very, very, very smart, <laughs> but because he is. Okay, and then context is also very important. I know a lot of PCs, uh, computers, um, cybers, cybers. I know a lot of cybers, you all do know a lot of cybers, but don't let me do that because that will not play out well. So then there's the consistency heuristic. I told you about this already. It is about fake news. And when you read it over and over and over and over again, it might become true for you. The danger is that we form bubbles. The algorithms of Facebook, Twitter, and all the other stuff there, they are meant for only one thing, to keep you on their side, to keep you watching, reading, looking, and they can do that by only one way, and that's by showing you more of what you already like. So they choose for you what news you get to see. And you don't get to see any contradictory news because you don't like that and you might just close your browser. So they show you more of the same. Only they don't check if it's true what they show you. Bandwagon, we, told, we talked about this persuasive intent. I like the illustration on this one. Um, and this is for the Dutch guys here. Uh, I'll just give you a second to, to, to read them all. Expectancy violation has to do with you, you have an expectancy. In this, in this case, it's the city, and you might think that guys working for the city, doing all kinds of official business, they know what they're doing, right? Well, they don't. At least not always. And these are examples of really, really gross spelling mistakes. Very funny ones as well. I mean, this, this here in, this should mean goes for the entire street. But the way they spell it means there's money for the entire street. <laughs> so it's, maybe they, they won this postcode low today, you know, the truck comes in. And that, that could be true, but why could it sign up? This is weird. So, um, I like the expectancy violation bias. It's very nice. Sometimes people make mistakes, and this is a pretty rough story. Um, we have the Dutch Ministry of Defense, and I can speak about this because it's a long time ago and it's fixed in the meantime. But, but this is the website of Miroslav Mindev, and the domain is mindev.nl. 
But that is also with one different, one little letter difference. It's the Ministry of Def Defense.nl. So the guy that ran this domain got all kinds of emails for the Dutch Ministry of Defense because people made a little spelling mistake. And there's, those were not funny, these mails. So when people make mistakes, even tiny ones, it can have large consequences. And if we can get people to make these mista mistakes on based on of the heuristics we already know, we just invite you to make the mistake. Like, like the little table there. It was not 25, but it's very easy to go for it. And you're in trouble, right? So truth. Uh, what is true? And this is a very hot discussion at this moment. Some things seem true. Some things feel true. It's, it has to do with experience and with what you can see and what you can hear and what you can touch. And, but is it? When I do a car trick or a trick with some ropes would turn out, turn out to be the same length or, or they don't, people see it happen. But what you see is not what's happening and what's happening is not what you see. That's the definition of an illusion. And that having said, truth is very, very fluid indeed. So in the US, they have this very, very cool oath when you go before a judge. You guys know that? You hear it on TV all the time, right? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I think this is genius. Because what you say is, okay, do you swear to tell the truth? That covers lies of commission, plain out lies. You just tell something that's not true. The other one, the whole truth, covers lies of omission, stuff you leave out. And it's also very easy to do. Yeah, I went to Bolivia on a business trip. I don't have to tell people that I have a mistress there. It was actually a business trip. Sorry, dear. Um, not true, by the way. Um, and nothing but the truth is lies of influence, and they are the tricky ones. Because how many times have you seen this in the courtroom dramas that a suspect does not really answer the question, but says, look, I'm a respectable guy, I would never do something like that, I'm a Bible salesman, and I'm volunteering at the school, and I'm doing this, I'm doing... He didn't answer the question. He's trying to get a way around... And these are lies of influence, just by getting yourself into what we call the halo effect, being a true angel. Become an angel, by the way, that's very... They need angels. Um, but getting yourself on that level of, look, I, I would never, you know... It's also lying, but it's very, very subtle and it's very hard to catch. And this is... Sometimes it's, it's um, how do you say that politely? <laughs> sometimes it's by design and sometimes it's just plain stupid. Amptenares. It's the language that civil servants tend to use. I see a lot of memos in my line of work and I have to take a lot of time to decipher what they really say. And for Dutch speaking, these are, and I have permission to show these, these are uh, actually WhatsApp messages of um, students working with the Dutch government, um, trainees, talking to each other about what they're going to do next. And if you read their WhatsApps, holy shit, that's not going to be funny if this guy really gets a, to be a civil servant, or this guy. That is bad. But we do that ourselves, because this is part of the Amptenarewet. It's the rules and regulation that dictate what a civil servant should and should not do. Look how that is written. Could you expect for, for any normal person to know what this says exactly? With all the ins and outs? You need a lawyer for that. You can't do that. And that causes a lot of mistakes as well. And then, this is a favorite of mine. It has been decided. Leid on the form is in Dutch. I, I don't really know the English uh, translation for Leid on the form because I'm not a grammar student, but... Um, passive tense. 
Thanks. Uh, passive tense. So you, you say, well, it has been decided. And, and so what has been decided? By who? When? Uh, what were the parameters? Uh, what, what, what were you guys talking about anyway? What meeting was that? And who decided? And was he even uh, competent to do that? Or uh, was he in charge? <laughs> anyway. No, it has been decided, you know, we, uh, we talked about it. And uh, so just be careful when you see this in a memo. Always try to get things very clear. And my colleagues hate me for it because I always return their memos. So I don't know, I, I don't understand. Just be clear and short. If you can't put it on the back of a coaster, I won't read it. They hate me for that, this is true. Then there's critical thinking. Um, this is a problem we have a lot these days. But I saw it on the internet, so it must be true. I saw it a lot of times on the internet. Oh, that's a consistency heuristic, right? But if you're in a certain bubble and things get filtered out, you don't know what gets left out of your bubble. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Anyone can learn to be a critical thinker, but no one seems to be or do so because it's inconvenient. You need your system too, the slow system for that. And that takes a lot of energy, which we don't always have. Not the time, not the energy. So that's a problem. There is a drug to help you. Um, so you could take this, if any of this comes your way. And this is a grain of salt. So think about that. When you hear some ravel and it comes over you like a thunderstorm, take this grain of salt. Take a step back. Go in your system too. And if you're too fatigued or pressed for time or whatever, just don't do it. Say, so look, I have to look at this more closely. I'll get back to you. Don't let them suck you into it. New silos are very dangerous. This is, what, this is where the consistency heuristic lives. I told you about this, uh, the, the Facebooks and the, the Twitters and Instagrams, they, they want you to stay on their page. So they will always tell you what you want to hear, not what you should hear. And they tell all your friends too, and they, they select friends for you to see in that same bubble. That's very dangerous. Um, we tried this with several accounts. We made new accounts, and uh, we po posted just one remark on Twitter at one account and the other. And one was um, for, for Trump, and the other was against Trump. And we left the accounts alone. And after a while, we, we looked at their uh, separate timelines. That was horrifying, the differences that you see, and the truth, truth in, in quotation marks that they try to tell you. Because actually the one that was quite positive about Trump got a lot of, this is true, and this is true, and this is true, and Trump is a great guy, and you would almost believe it, and the other one was exactly the opposite. It can't both be true, right? This guy says it very well. If you, if you want to take a picture of the screen, this is, this is the picture you should take. Um, he says this, these bubbles, you don't get to decide what gets in or out, and you don't know what gets left out. This is a very, very strong remark. And always be aware of this. Thanks. So, you have an opinion, right? That's great. Um, these guys, if you know Dutch politics, these are the, the most left guy and the most right guy. And they try to make you believe that there is such a thing as left and right, which there is obviously not. I mean, you can be all for climate, and we have to save the climate, and I think so too. But you can't be against a lot of other things that we also need to just only save the climate and only give money to poor people and be very, very, very left. And that it's ridiculous. You have to keep thinking about each separate problem and, and try to get to the bottom of it. A lot of people don't get that. Um, but I've looked into this and Daniel Offman has made a diagram. And I thought I could use that to, to illustrate what I mean. So if you take a core quality, let's say we have mobility. Uh, you want to get from here to there, and maybe you work a long way from home, so you need a car, right? But a car comes with problems. If it's too much, we have pollution, we have traffic jams, we have all these things. 
Um, so we need to mitigate. We need to find some ways, and that could be anything. We could make bigger or better roads, or more roads, or less cars, or try to spread uh, traffic over a period of time. Or there's a lot of things we could talk about to mitigate the problem that arises from mobility. But if you go too much the other way, you get to be Amsterdam. Ban all combustion engines. Amsterdam sucks, by the way. If you have a car, don't go there. Um, so um, that's the allergy. Don't go there. And what we see is when you have a debate about things, best do it in the green zone. This is what we actually want. We, we recognize the problems and we have a challenge. And let's talk about this. What you see in debate, in politics, is guys going nuts about that. Because it's very strong, right? Ban all combustion engines. Yeah. Good for you. Right, but it's not a discussion you should want to see. It should be in the green zone. So, and, and then there is, of course, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Heard about it? I love the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, it's, the theory is that the, the less you know about something, the more you feel like knowing about it. So when I bought a computer in 1983, uh, I, I learned some basic and I did some weird stuff. And I thought, oh, I'm the biggest expert in the street. And in fact, I was because I was the only computer user in the street, but you get a lot of confidence from that. And of course you do. When you grow into that profession, you, you think, okay, now I, do, I know a lot about it. And you come here and you think, I don't know shit. <laughs> so, that's, that's, um, so probably when you think that, you are somewhere here on the slope of enlightenment. But everyone seems to start at the peak of Mount Stupid. Your confidence is really high, but your knowledge is not. And I love this diagram. It's my favorite slide of the entire deck. So, then there is influence by proxy. And Centric hates me for leaving this in. Um, they asked me now several times to get their logo the fuck out of there, but we, know, we all know what influence by proxy is by now, right? It's Rian van Rijbroek against Gerard Sandring. She is whispering in his ears, isolating him from the rest of the world, because this guy is not stupid. He's a millionaire. He knows what he's doing. The only reason he believes in her is that he doesn't get any other information. He's in a bubble. So that's a problem. And influenced by proxy, he is the boss of all these companies, but she runs them. It's very dangerous. Um, this I'll leave for now. This is what I meant with brevity. When I get a very long memo, and it's very elaborate, and there is a lot of passive tense, thanks, um, I just send it back. So I, I don't get what you're saying here. It's too long to read. It's too complicated for me. I don't get it. And I'll just play stupid. So tell, explain me like I'm five. And you got a lot of discussion about that and say, okay, but you're not five years old. You went to university. Yes, I know, but explain like I'm five. Because it prevents you from lying <laughs> and hiding it. So, and, and that's actually very hard to get to the point. So that's why this phrase is very nice. I'm sorry I had to write such a long letter, but I didn't have time to write a short one. Because you have to think about that. Get to the point. Okay, fishing I'll leave out because everyone here knows about fishing, right? Um, this is a very nice tweet. These are some random shots that I collected here and there. Um, the professor uh, Fu Ling Yu, he is uh, a security philosopher. Actually, it's me. <laughs> and he said, well, criminals, they have a new way to make you pay a lot of money for, you know, anything. So, um, for only 3500 I'll tell you all about it. Of course, this is funny, right? But not why you think it is. It's not because I might be the criminal and I get to th the 35 just by saying, okay, I'll tell you the secret. That's not what it is. Because in the boardrooms, we get swindled a lot. And if you get a consultant for 3,500 and he says, look, that is 1.6 million not well spent, I wouldn't do that. That's money well spent, right? 
They save you from a lot of trouble. So nothing is really what it seems. This seems to be a bad idea, but it's not. Not in Africa. So just give me the 35 and it's good. Um, here are some countermeasures. Uh, most of them I already touched. Ask for clarity and details. And just tell them, it's too long. Too long, I didn't read. It's too complicated. Make it simple. Make simple statements. I want to know what you're actually saying. Um, go to your system too. Think about it. Don't let yourself get pressed into time. Your brain consists of three parts. Ten minutes, thanks. We have the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex. This is, your, this is where the thinking happens. This is what most of us do here. Um, then there's the middle part, which is mostly medical. There is all kinds of subsistence there, uh, hormones, uh, drugs. Um, there's all kinds of stuff going on there. And then there is the reptilian brain, and this is the link to Jurassic Park, the, the dinosaur at the front, um, which is actually the boss of them all. And this is where fear, flight, fight, all those responses come from. So if you try to tap in this here, all the other brain parts will be silent, or at least distorted enough not to function very well. If you tap into this one, the emotional bit, hormones, that's why men do stupid things. You see a nice lady and think, ooh, that's nice, and this stops working. That's why, ladies, that's why we do that. So, if you want them to piss off, tap in the other one, because the hierarchy is from here to here. This is the boss. Scare them. <laughs> Propose. That's very scary. Um, so, call in external expertise. That's a very good countermeasure. And discuss scope creep. We have seen that in several projects, um, also in Amsterdam, the new subway system, way over time, way over budget, but it couldn't go back. So that's a problem. Discuss it and discuss the exit terms. Because you can't build half a subway system and say, oh yeah, okay, we'll just stop, get some landfill, close it up. Shame. So you have to discuss those things. Um, our world in data, I want, just wanted to mention it. It's a very good resource uh, for statistics. If you want to know if something is actually true, poverty is rising. Well, these guys, they, they kept record of poverty over the last 20 years, so go look. Is it actually true? Our world in data, it's very good. Yes. So reclaim your brain, get rid of bad apps from your phone. This is, I, I told you the talk is actually bigger, so I tell people to get rid of WhatsApp and stuff like that. Uh, browser extensions, that's also for the, the larger part. Um, and ask questions, this is very important. Try to be the, the boss of the conversation and try to pinpoint all the heuristics they're getting to. And, you know, marketeers, good marketeers, they know all this stuff already. It's up to you to also know. Um, task segregation, we also know. Uh, communicate. This is, this is important as well. Uh, if I social engineer someone, uh, let's say I want to get into this, this complex here, and I, I don't have a ticket, and I go try it that way, and I make a lot of fuss, and they send me away, and I'll try the other en entrance, and they don't know about me, it might work. But if those guys get on the radio and say, look, there's a weird guy here trying to get in, so everyone be on the lookout, you know, it's weird. My chances are very slim after that. So these are some sources. Um, Hersenhek, it's a Dutch. Magriet Sitzkorn, neurosurgeon. Um, very, very good book. Uh, read it. Uh, Factfulness, Hans Rosling. He's no longer alive, but he left us a great book. And uh, Richard Nisbet with Mindware, also very, very well recommended. And listen to the podcast, because it's fun. <laughs> no, you don't have to. Right, Cyber, thank you. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Great. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please line up uh, by the microphone in the middle. 
And uh, first, we'll check with Signal. Uh, so we, okay, none for the internet right now. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and start with the first question? Uh, thank you, at first, for the talk. It was very interesting, and I learned a lot. I was wondering about the principle of um, people like which are in extremely uh, bubbles, but they but they know but they think everyone else is in a bubble. So they know the theory about bubbles, they know the theory about how you get the information you want, yes. but they think they're the only one with the truth and that everyone else is being lied to in the bubble and et cetera. And like, for example, the flat earth um, people, S -s some things like that, like the most ridiculous truths, but still they, they, know, they know all the theories which are being discussed, they, but they, can't seem to apply it to themselves. They only they use it to discredit everyone else. Can you tell us, have you had some tips? Have yeah, you... of course. These, these are complot theorists, and uh, this works exactly that way. There's bubbles, and they get served all the stuff they want to hear. And sometimes some, some little proof seeps in, like we have a picture of the Earth, right? <laughs> it's not flat, but they, flat, they just deny that. Say, so look, but you're all out to get us. I see this the entire day, and everybody's telling me, and so you must be wrong. And that's what's happening. And if your bubble gets large enough, you, you, get, you tend to be, you know, these, these neuro parts, the new parts that you are creating by constantly seeing the same and the same and the same over again, these parts are very hard to break. So this is what happens. Most curious in is like, they they tell so they know that bubbles exist they know that oh you're in a bubble you're so of course yes why can they um s mirror that to their own situation why because if i get a new theory like if i hear this and i wouldn't know about it i think oh maybe this applies to me maybe this but uh, how can you know that it exists, but then not applying it to yourself. That's, that's the thing like I'm yeah, wondering what happens. That's called confirmation bias. Uh, and you are naturally inclined to always look at what supports your belief. So things that don't support your belief, they don't feel good. Because nobody likes to be wrong. So I have some pieces of information, and because of the bubble I have a lot of this, and there is this. And that doesn't, it just doesn't feel good. So I'll try to find some reasons to deny it or ignore it or whatever. Because, uh, and that's confirmation bias. You're always looking for confirmation what you already think is the truth. That's a natural tendency. It's one of the heuristics. And uh, we, we just have time for one last question, if it's somewhat brief and direct, concise, like he was advising. I'll try. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, can you talk a bit about how you got started with social engineering? Excuse me? Can you talk a bit about how you started get with social engineering? Oh, this is a very long story, but um, if you guys like, I'd be over there somewhere, or we'll find a nice spot, drink some water, do drink water, uh, and just find me here, uh, and we can talk some more if you like. And, and g given uh, his, his expertise, uh, you should engage to see what it's like to to be social with a social engineer. And with that, let's, let's thank him again for it's an amazing talk. I can tell you. <laughs>